As we saw with the case of Harry Dobkin in episode 33 of Tales from the Hangman's Record, the wartime enforced blackout aided criminality. This was particularly true with regards to larceny, burglary and shot breaking. Shrouded in darkness, a lack of any form of sophisticated alarm system and a chronic manpower shortage, criminals could make a good living thieving and selling on the black market. This story, from the normally peaceful village of Coxhoe, a few miles south of the ancient city of Durham in the northeast of England, was to have a major impact a dozen years later on one of the most notorious cases in the 20th century. It was a miner making his way home down Wesley Road, Coxhoe, in the early hours of Thursday the 29th of February 1940 that alerted the police. Cycling past the cooperative store, Jesse Smith noticed a light flicker in the top floor window. In the blackout that was enforced throughout the country, it was enough to draw attention. In a grocery store closed for the day, it was enough to raise suspicion. Just as quickly as it appeared, it was extinguished, but Smith had caught the sight of a face at the window, and assuming a robbery was taking place, he hurried to the local police station. Police Constable William Shield and War Reserve Constable William Stafford were on duty, and accompanied by Smith and another miner, William Wilson, who had been chatting to the bobbies, they hurried to the store 200 yards away. Shield immediately took charge of the situation. He posted Smith on a nearby corner, while PC Stafford and Wilson went to the back of the shop. Stafford tried the doorknob, but in the still of the night, the rattling had clearly caused panic in the shop, as the thieves began to stumble around in the darkness. Shield could hear Ray's voices and was just about to force the front door, when, like a scene from a cowboy movie, a man came crashing out of the front shop window. He rose from the pavement and dusted himself down, as moments later, a second man followed him through the broken glass. Both men sped past the startled constable and headed up the street. PC Shield shouted for them to stop, blew his whistle and ran after them. Both men reached a field at the end of the village called Petterson's Opening. From here the two men made their way to another field facing Long Row, by which point the policeman had almost caught up with them. It was here one of the men uttered the words, later disputed by him at the trial, let him have it. Then a single shot rang out and PC Shield fell to the ground, mortally wounded. The two thieves fled into the darkness, a car started up and screeched away into the night. Stafford reached his injured colleague a few moments later. He was soon joined by the others who had attended the break-in, plus furnace worker Robert Sanderson, who lived at 53 Long Row and had heard everything. In such a rural setting as Coxhoe, very few folk possessed a telephone, so, as someone went to summon an ambulance, PC Shield was carried into Sanderson's kitchen and made comfortable on a rug in front of the fire. The constable was still conscious and given a glass of water and a cigarette as he waited for help to arrive. He tried to undo his tunic to examine the wound and stop the blood gushing, but was told to rest and wait for the doctor. An ambulance took the wounded officer to Durham County Hospital, where many of the stricken policeman's colleagues and the two miners hurried to assist with the offer to donate blood. It soon became clear the wound was inoperable and the police constable would be unlikely to survive the night. Superintendent Johnson, his commanding officer, was given the distressing task of telling PC Shield that not only was he going to die, but that his duty was that he had to make a last declaration which would be admissible in court. A local magistrate was quickly summoned as PC Shield swore on the Bible the evidence he was about to give was the truth. He said that both men were in their mid to late twenties, dark haired and about five foot eight tall. It was also very clear that immediately before the shot rang out, one of them had said, All right, let him have it, he is all alone. At 4.30 on the morning of Friday the 1st of March, Police Constable William Ralph Shields died from his injuries. He was just 28 years old and left a wife Frieda and a three-year-old daughter Barbara. At once, word was sent to all police stations around the North East and armed police set up roadblocks in and out of Durham, Sunderland and Newcastle, stopping scores of cars and questioning hundreds of people. On the following day, Coxo and the surrounding villages were in a state of deep shock as dozens of CID officers from Newcastle combed the area for clues. Durham Constabulary immediately offered a reward of £100 for information but police already had a number of clues to work on. 
A toolbox had been found in the shop, and tracks made by a getaway car were thought to belong to a grey Vauxhall, similar to one stolen from a doctor in Chester the Street earlier that week, and seen parked up in the area earlier that night. Witnesses then came forward to say a similar car was being driven by two petty crooks shortly before the shooting. PC Shield was a well-liked traditional local bobby, known for being firm but fur. And such was the affection they held for him, that four days later when he was buried, the whole village stopped work for the day as a mark of respect. And St Andrew's Church in nearby Spennymoor was packed for the funeral. In addition to the locals, some 200 police officers from all over Durham were present. As PC Shields was being laid to rest, officers were busy interviewing two suspects picked up in the early hours of the previous day. Murder squad detectives based in Durham received information from colleagues in West Yorkshire that a car matching the description of the one stolen and wanted in connection with the shooting had been found burnt out on the road outside Holmforth. In addition to this, Yorkshire police knew the identities of two local criminals, 24-year-old Vincent Osler and 27-year-old William Appleby, who both lived and worked in the Bradford area and were suspected of being involved in a number of unsolved burglaries in and around the city. Armed police from Durham arrested Appleby at his home near Otley. Taken to Bradford City Police Station, he denied being a thief and claimed he made a living as a coffin maker. He admitted that with a wife and young child, he found it difficult to make ends meet, but emphatically denied being involved in the burglary at Coxo and the shooting of the policeman. The Durham detectives were warned by their Yorkshire colleagues that Osler was suspected of carrying a revolver. Detectives surrounded his remote bungalow and as four armed policemen burst into the bedroom he reached for a loaded gun under his pillow but was bundled to the ground and arrested before he had chance to fire. Osler was married with four children and the son of a former police sergeant although his father had been dismissed. He too strongly denied being in Coxaw and refused to answer any further questions other than to admit he owned a firearm but said he would never shoot a copper. Detectives knew that when two criminals undertake a joint venture, one is always weaker than the other, and if they could find the one to break, they would be able to solve their case. Under questioning, it was soon clear that Appleby was the weaker, not a hardened criminal like his accomplice, and soon brought down and confessed. Appleby admitted his part of the burglary, but was adamant he did not know that Osler carried a gun. He denied saying let him have it, instead claimed he had shouted, give him a clout. By this he assumed Osler would punch the policeman to the ground and never for a moment thought he would shoot him. The two men were remanded in custody for a week and driven in a police van to Durham Jail. According to a prison officer escorting them, Osler had admonished Appleby, stating, if you had kept your mouth shut, we would be in the clear. Now, and with Appleby's confession and the overheard confession by the prison warder, detectives went to work on Osler and got him to make a statement. Osler now told the police that since he had teamed up with Appleby, the pair had committed a dozen or so robberies throughout the North East. They always went for grocery shops and had an oxygen settling tank to break open the safe. Their operations were well planned, and they often came away with large sums of cash or goods that they would sell on the black market. The two men appeared at the Assize Court in Leeds on Monday the 6th of May before Mr Justice Hilbury. Mr Russell Vick KC led for the Crown. Mr Paley Scott defended Osler while Appleby's defence was handled by Mr Willoughby Jardine. By now Osler had changed his story and both were fighting for their lives. Osler admitted he had stolen the doctor's Vauxhall prior to the killing but he said he had abandoned it on the Yorkshire moors near Holmforth and was never anywhere near Coxall. His father, Vincent Osler Sr., the disgraced ex-policeman, claimed his son had stayed the night with him. Thus, Osler's defence was simply that he was not there. Unfortunately for Osler, Appleby completely contradicted his story. Appleby's testimony was more complicated. 
His defence accepted that he was there and a party to the burglary, but he ought not to be guilty of the killing, and if the jury thought he was, then their verdict should be manslaughter and not murder. Appleby told the court that Ian Osler had driven to Coxo in the morning to check out the co-op store for the burglary. With the job lined up, they then drove to Durham, had some tea and went to the cinema. Then, after a few drinks, they drove back to Coxo in the early hours of the morning. He said that they had perched up the car ready to load the stolen goods into it and gained entry through the back of the cooperative store. They were in the building for over an hour when they were disturbed and made their getaway through the front window. Appleby then told the court that he only wanted Osler to punch PC Shield and he never contemplated that Osler would cause the officer's death or cause him grievous harm. He said that as the pair drove back to Bradford, Osler, believing he had shot the officer in the leg, said, I hope that copper doesn't snuff it. However, the law, in respect of an accomplice, may be harsh, but it was pragmatic and clear. If two persons engage in the commission of a crime with a common resolution to resist by violence, either expressly or by implication, and one of them kills a police officer, then both are guilty of murder. It mattered not that the accomplice did not do the killing or was even party to it. Thus, the prosecution counsel asked the jury for a verdict of murder in Appleby's case in that the law implied violence even if Appleby had only said give him a clout as opposed to let him have it which the dying officer had testified. Appleby, under English law in respect of murder, had unwittingly condemned himself by his own words. On May the 10th, the jury needed little over two hours to return a guilty verdict. In the case of Appleby, who had not fired the fatal shot, they asked the judge to recommend mercy. William Appleby and Vincent Osler were sentenced to hang and removed to the condemned cells at Durham Jail. Both men appealed against the conviction. In Osler's case, it was submitted that Appleby's evidence against him should be inadmissible because he was an accomplice, and in Appleby's case, that the judge had misdirected the jury in regards to the law of murder. The appeal was heard on June 25th, Spokesman for the Appeal Court, Mr Justice Humphreys, said the common law of England has always given an additional protection to a police officer in that it implied malice aforethought for murder where a police officer died as a result of a criminal venture where the violence used was intentional. He added that the Appeal Court was satisfied that the two men were jointly responsible for PC Shield's death and since it was intentional both men were correctly convicted of murder. The judge stressed that the violence required to show the murder of a police officer was much less than in ordinary cases. With the appeal dismissed, the two men were now relying on the mercy of Home Secretary John Anderson, a firm supporter of capital punishment. It was a forlorn hope. On Thursday the 11th of July, the two burglars came face to face for the last time when they stood side by side on the gallows at Durham Jail. Veteran hangman Thomas Pierpont carried out the execution assisted by Stanley Cross, Alex Riley and his young nephew Albert. It was the third of four double executions at Durham in the 20th century and in the first, some 32 years earlier, Tom Pierpoint had assisted his brother and one of those men had committed a murder following a robbery at a co-op, this one 20 miles further north at Gateshead. William Appleby maintained not to have shouted, let him have it the declaration of a dying policeman was never questioned. Although it was never in doubt that Osler had fired the fatal shot, Appleby was judge of encouraged him and was therefore equally as guilty. Twelve years later, those very same words and claims were made in the Craig and Bentley case when a policeman was shot in South London. 19-year-old Darren Bentley hanged alone as Christopher Craig was only 16 and too young to be executed claimed never to have encouraged his friend to let him have it. John Perris, Craig's barrister at the trial, later wrote that police officers were well instructed at the legal implications of the Appleby and Osler case and how those damning words had secured a conviction. Coincidence, or did this case have a far more sinister impact on the young London teenager? My name is Steve Fielding. 
Thank you for listening to and watching another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. If you have enjoyed this presentation, please press like, and if you don't already, can I ask you to take a few seconds to subscribe. There is no cost, it just helps to keep the channel on the air and informs you when new content is published. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find information on all my previous and current books, and also order copies of the three-volume Hangman's Record 1868-1964 trilogy at a special discount price. My latest book, Tales from the Hangman's Record Volume 1, is now available from Amazon as a paperback and Kindle download. Also look out for my two podcast channels, Tales from the Hangman's Record and Mostly Murder, which will feature cases that do not come under the scope of the Hangman's Record series. Do you think the verdict in this case was correct? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this episode and also for suggestions for further cases to be featured in the Tales from the Hangman's Record series.